President uh, Joe Biden is now uh, about to step up to the mic. He's getting ready to sign an executive order aiming for half of all new vehicles to be electric, fuel cell electric, or plug-in hybrid by the year 2030. It's part of the White House strategy to fight global warming. We're going to go ahead and listen in. Please, everybody sit down. Please, please, please. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I, uh, before I begin, let me start with something uh, I apologize more somber. I, uh, I learned a couple of hours ago when my staff came in that a close friend of mine, and I think of many of you as well, Rich Trumpka died today from a heart attack. The reason I was a few minutes late coming out, and I apologize for that, I was talking to his wife and to his son who called. He wasn't just a great labor leader. He was a friend, and his friend of yours too, Debbie, I think. And he's someone I could confide in, and uh, you knew whatever he said he'd do, he would do. It was simple, Tommy, you knew him well as well. He was always there. He was an American worker always fighting for working people, protecting their wages, their safety, their pensions, and their ability to build a middle-class life. I've also believed that the middle class built America, but I know who built the middle class, unions. Unions built the middle class. There is no doubt that Rich Trumka helped build unions all across this country. My heart goes out to Barbara and Rich Jr. and the grandkids, and uh, I might point out that uh, you know, uh, I used to always kid him. He was from soft coal country. I was from hard coal country. <laughs> we used to have this thing about, you know, he used to be president of the United Mine Workers, and that's how he got started. Folks, um, uh, let, let, let me now turn to today's events. event. I want to thank Bernie for the introduction and for being part of the best water, auto workers in the world. Thank you, Ray Curry, president of the UAW. If you're here, Ray, I was in with you. Good to see you, pal. And I also want to thank the leaders of the big three companies for being here today. Mary Barra, Barry, she, General Motors. She, I want to tell you, I think she's one of the reasons we're here today. We had a long discussion on a Zoom call with a bunch of labor leaders and other, uh, other major business leaders, and uh, she made a commitment. And she's keeping it. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Jim Farley of Ford. And by the way, my dad is in the automobile business. He sold Fords for a while, but mostly General Motors projects, uh, uh, products. But you see that sucker over there? Zero to 60 in 4.1 seconds. It's all electric. I tell you what, and I want to say publicly, I have a commitment from Mary when they make the first electric Corvette. I get to drive it. <laughs> right, Mary? <laughs> you think I'm kidding. I'm not kidding. And my entire Secret Service detail went, oh, my God, let's go. And Mark Stewart of Stellantis. I, uh, you know, I, Mark, uh, um, we used to have one of your big plants in my state. And uh, as, as the man I'm about to recognize, you know, a special thanks to all the members of Congress who are here, but I want to pay particular uh, uh, recognition to my chairman, my buddy, we served together for years, Tommy Carper. Tom, and I know that uh, I, I kid my Michigan friends, but, um, you know, uh, uh, I, uh, I just want you to know, uh, say to Senators Heinrich and Markey and White House and Padilla and uh, you know, uh, Duckworth, and I'm leaving some folks out, I'm sure, Representative Kathy Castor, uh, um, you know, and the Michigan delegation that's here today, Debbie Stabenow, uh, Senator Gary Peters, Congresswoman Debbie Dingell, who is automobiles, and, uh, and Dan Kildee. But I want you all to know, I remind the Michigan delegation of this. It used to be when I was first got elected, Deb, and I used to tell your husband this as well. We had a higher percentage of auto workers in Delaware than any state in the union, including, including Michigan. 
Now, the fact we had a very small population and we and we had almost 100,000 auto workers in our states, counting the auto light and others was uh, had something to do with it. But uh, I, uh, I just want to be very straightforward. Uh, you know, uh, UAW brung me to the dance, as they say. And I also know we're missing someone truly special and a dear friend of all of us, uh, Senator Carl Levin, who passed away last week. Carl and I served together uh, uh, for 30 years in the United States Senate together. He was one of the most, I think all my colleagues in Newman will attest to this, one of the most honorable people, most decent people I've not only served with, but I've ever known. He was a tireless champion, an American worker, and the iconic American automobile industry. And so he embodied everything that his beloved Michigan and, and, his, and our country represents respect, dignity, pride, pride in the nation and pride in what we built. And so today, uh, labor and industry, state and local leaders, we're all working together to write the next chapter of the American story. As I've said before, we're in competition with China and many other nations for the 21st century. To win, we're going to have to make sure the future will be made in America. You know, back in May, I toured the Ford plant, as I mentioned, a state-of-the-art facility in Dearborn, where the UAW workers like Bernie are b building the first ever all-electric Ford 150. And as I said, the best part is I got to drive it. It's incredible, and it's just like the other vehicles that are behind me today. They're a vision of the future that is now beginning to happen, a future of the automobile industry that is electric battery electric, plug-in hybrid electric, fuel cell electric. It's electric, and, and, and there's no turning back. The question is whether we'll lead or fall behind in the race for the future. It's whether we'll build these vehicles and the batteries that got them to where they are in the United States, here in the United States, we're going to have to rely on other countries for those batteries. Whether or not the job to build these vehicles and batteries are good paying union jobs, jobs with benefits, jobs that are going to sustain the continued growth of the middle class. They have to be. They have to be made here in America. Right now, China is leading the race. It is one of the largest and fastest growing electric vehicle markets in the world. And a key part of the electric vehicle, to state the obvious, is the battery. And right now, 80% of the manufacturing capacity for these batteries is done in China. And here's the deal. It's not that China battery, it's not China's battery technology that's much more innovative than anyone else's. Remember, our national labs in America, our universities, our automakers led in the development of this technology. We led in the development of this technology. And there's no reason why we can't reclaim that leadership and lead again. But we just have to move, and we have to move fast. You know, when Barack and I were in office, President Obama and I were in office, that's what we were doing. In 2009, the automobile industry was flat on its back. We were told that we'd never be able to sell American-made cars at the same rate as we did before. But we didn't listen to the naysayers. We even had some in, all, in both parties who didn't think we should, quote, bail out the industry, if you remember. Well, we bet on the American worker, and we extended a lifeline. And they stepped up, made sacrifices to do it, and they saved more than a, we saved more than a million jobs in the process. Working with the auto industry, we set fuel efficiency standards and provided incentives for folks to buy fuel efficient vehicles. Through the Recovery Act, we made the largest investment in clean energy and battery technology ever made. And then the previous administration came along into office, and they rolled back the standards we set. Despite bipartisan support, for consumer incentives, they also let the federal tax credit expire, penalizing auto workers who were at the time selling the most electric vehicles in the world, in the United States. They announced, infrastructure, when we, they announced infrastructure week. They did it for every week for four years and not once got anything done. Not once. Folks, the rest of the world is moving ahead. And we've just got to step up. Government, labor, and industry working together, which you're seeing here today, we have a playbook, and it's going to work. Today, I'm announcing steps we're taking to set a new pace for electric vehicles. First, I'm following through on the campaign commitment to reverse the previous administration's short-sighted rollback of vehicle emissions and efficiency standards. 
I'm doing so in, with the support of the auto industry, the automobile industry. Today, the Environmental Protection Agency and the Department of Transportation are unveiling proposals to do just that. These agencies are beginning to work on the next round of standards for a broad class of vehicles, for cars, SUVs, pickup trucks, medium and heavy duty vehicles. Importantly, we have announcements today from automakers representing nearly the entire auto industry market who have, posi who have positioned around the ambition of 40 to 50 percent of all vehicles sold by 2030 in America being electric. This is a big deal. But to unlock the full potential, we have to keep investing in our workers and our manufacturing capacity. And that's what our Build Back Better plan is all about. It's about leveraging once in a generation investments and a whole of government effort to lift up American auto workers and strengthen and strengthen the American leadership in the world in the clean car technology, trucks, and not just cars, but trucks as well and buses. You know, that's why today I'm signing an executive order setting out a target of 50 percent of all passenger vehicles sold by 2030 will be electric and set into motion an all out effort. That's why, along with the members of Congress here today, we're working around the clock on the Build Back Better plan, which does three critical things. One, it transforms our infrastructure. We're going to put Americans to work modernizing our roads, our highways, our ports, our airports, rail and transit systems. You know, that included putting IBEW members and other union workers to work, installing a national network of 500,000 charging stations along our roads and highways and at our homes and our apartments. Two, we're going to boost our manufacturing capacity. The Build Back Better plan invests in new rooted facilities, uh, excuse me, new and retool facilities and employed workers with good paying wages, good jobs. It grants the grants to kickstart new battery and parts production, loans and tax credits to boost manufacturing of these clean vehicles. And our Build Back, Better, Build Back Better plan makes the largest investment in research and development in generations. This will help innovate, manufacture and build the supply chains for batteries, semiconductors and those small computer chips and electric trucks and cars are going to be even more re relying upon as we move forward. Never again should we be in a situation we face today with a semiconductor shortage. And we know these kinds of federal investments, we know that they work. It was the Defense Department and NASA that got the modern semiconductor industry on its feet decades ago. Our own Department of Energy pioneered and transformed the battery industry where Barack and I, when we went into office, when we were in office. And with the help of the Recovery Act, grants and loans, Battery prices dropped 85% because we were forward-looking. We need that same mindset today. Thirdly, support of consumers and fleets. That means purchasing incentives for consumers to buy clean vehicles, union-made right here in America, like the ones championed by Debbie Stabenow and Ron Wyden in the Senate, which provide $7,500 basic credit $2,500 credit for vehicles made in America and an additional $2,500 credit for union-made vehicles. That means spurring demand by converting the federal government's enormous fleet of vehicles. We have over 600,000 of vehicles. We have a lot of vehicles, 60,000 of them, I should say, into an all-American made clean vehicles. So that's what we're going to do as we as we roll out and get rid of the existing fleet, we're going to support the electric transit system as well and the electric school buses. Look, and there's one other thing we have in our playbook that will help us outcompete other nations, the American worker, the American worker. I really believe this, and I know you guys do too. The American workers are ace in the deck. Now I know many of you watching at home I like the folks I grew up in Scranton and Claymont, Delaware. They feel left out, left behind in an economy and an industry that's rapidly changing. I get it. I understand it. But we're going to leave no one behind. Nearly 90 percent of the jobs created in our infrastructure plan do not require a bachelor's degree. 
And when we invest in our infrastructure, we're going to buy American products, American materials, and services from American businesses made in America by American workers. And we're going to do everything in our power to encourage and protect the right of workers to unionize and collectively bargain. The bottom line is, we are proposing a blue-collar blueprint to rebuild America. That's what it's going to be. And we need automakers and other companies to keep investing in America. We need them not to take the benefits of our public investments and expand electric vehicles and battery manufacturing and production abroad. We need you to deepen your partnership with the UAW, continue to pay good wages, support local communities across the country. That's why I'm so proud the UAW is standing here today as well. It's why I'm proud that the three largest employers are sitting and here and their sights are set, not only on electric vehicles, but on expansion, expanding union jobs, expanding the middle class. It matters. You know, in the spring, uh, I kept my commitment to convene leaders of all the major economies in the world. On, it was not in person, but we did it, we did it on a Zoom call with a, a whole bunch of folks including the heads of state of China, India, Japan, the European Union, for meeting hosted in the White House on the most consequential issues facing the world. And the agreement was, it's the climate crisis. And I made clear, I made clear what I've long believed and I think of when I think of the climate crisis. Beyond the devastation of the lives and livelihoods and the health of our very planet, when I hear climate, I think jobs, good paying union jobs. I wanted the world to see there was a consensus that all that that were at an inflection point in world history. If we act to save the planet, we can also come out of it better. We can create millions of good paying jobs that generate significant economic growth and opportunity, raise the standard of living for people not only here but around the world. But I also wanted to put the world on notice. America is back. America is back. We're in the competition for the 21st century, the future that will be built right here in America. Let me close with this. Our economy is recovering. In six months, we're seeing the fastest job growth on record at this point in any administration in history, the fastest economic growth in nearly 40 years. And we've shown each other in the world that there's no quit in America. None, none, none. And it's never, ever, ever been a good bet to bet against America. We are the United States of America. There's not a single solitary thing, nothing, beyond our capacity to get done if we and when we do it together. We have to act. And that's what we're doing today. And again, I want to thank this, the CEOs of the automobile companies. And I also want to thank all the auto workers. Thank you all for being here today. Now, I'm going to sign the executive order, but I'd like to invite my congressional colleagues to come up if they're willing to stand behind me here when we do this, and others who know they're supposed to come on up. Thank you all very much. Certainly willing. Mr. President. Good to see you. Good to see you. How are you? Mr. President. Good to see you. Good to see you. I love that amendment. I hope I didn't get in trouble. Okay, so the President of the United States there on the uh, South Lawn uh, of the White House. Uh, he's getting ready to sign that executive order aiming to curb greenhouse gas emissions, saying the future of the automobile industry is electric. Let's bring in White House correspondent Mary Alice Parks. Just talk a little bit more about what the President uh, had to say. No surprises. He pretty much laid it out, right? By 2030, he wants electric uh, fuel cell electric or plug-in hybrid cars to be made, uh, you know, make it better for the environment, uh, better on the... Uh, the uh, pocketbook and better for America. Yeah, Kerry, he said the rest of the world is moving ahead. And he's not wrong that China has ramped up its development of electric vehicles, that experts say we're going to see an explosion of electric vehicles on the market. Some estimates that we could see a doubling of the number of electric vehicles every year for the next few years. And so you heard the president saying, we can either be a part of this or not, and I'd like us to be a part of it. He said that when we work to 
save the planet. We can also work to raise the standard of living. When he thinks of fighting climate change, he thinks of jobs, jobs, jobs. That's a message we've heard from this president before. Uh, but Kira, I was a little bit struck by what we didn't hear the president say. I, I was expecting he would give some indication to what n the new fuel economy is standards that the EPA and, and Department of Transportation would be rolling out. Uh, you know, there's a big question right now about whether he's going to go back to the fuel economy standards that were laid out during the Obama administration or whether he would try to do even better and, as some Democrats say, sort of make up for the lost time under the Trump administration, which rolled those standards back. He didn't give any preview to that, so that's still a big question mark. All right, well, we'll definitely follow it. Mary Alice Parks, thank you so much. Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.